Yes. Hello. Yes. We're good. Okay. So, hi everyone. My name is Pierre Ronseret. I just started my group at uh, Aix Marseille University in Marseille, in France. And I'd like to tell you about a story that I started uh, with uh, Sheng Mao, Andrei Koshmol, and Miko Hataya in, when I, I was in Princeton up until last year on liquid liquid phase separation inside cells and the role of elastic networks in uh, limiting the size of these uh, liquid liquid phase separated condensates. So if you've been attending this seminar or any biophysics conference lately, you've, you've probably heard that liquid liquid phase separation, meaning the demixing of one liquid in another, is emerging as an, uh, an important paradigm for intracellular organization, both in the cellular cytoplasm and in the cell nucleus, uh, in order to form what is uh, are called typically membraneless condensates or membraneless organelles. And there's a broad variety of these, uh, from the nucleoli to the stress granules to P bodies and, and many others. What I'm going to focus on today is the fact that these liquid liquid phase separated objects are not quite like little oil droplets in water, which is the usual uh, picture that we have for, for, for phase separation. They're actually in a more, much more complex environment than, than water, both inside the cytoplasm and inside the cell nucleus there's a dense meshwork of uh, fibers that forms an elastic network. So there's the cytoskeleton made of microtubules, actin, and intermediate filaments in the cytoplasm. And in the cell nucleus, there's chromatin, which occupies actually a significant fraction, volume fraction of the nucleus. And the question I'd like to ask today is, what are the rules of liquid-liquid separation of the formation of these membranous organelles in such a complex environment? How do these biomolecular condensates interact with the surrounding elastic network and what happens to the network? So there's a few, uh, that there are a few works that have looked at what happens to a network, uh, an elastic network when you phase separate a droplet. One, one of which is uh, by the group of Cliff Brongwin, to which I collaborated, which, is, uh, which uses optonate genetically induced condensation. So you turn on the light and you have a protein that phase separates. And when you form these red blobs, that these red droplets, and when, when you turn it off, it dissolves again. And what, what uh, we observed then is that the, when you do that and you look at what happens to the chromatin, there's a pocket that opens in it. And so the chromatin is expelled, at least most of the chromatin is expelled for sure. Another series of works that has looked at uh, liquid-liquid phase separation uh, in an elastic network is the group of Eric Dufresne in uh, ETH Zurich, which has this beautiful uh, and finely control controllable uh, in vitro systems uh, made of oil demixing in an artificial PDMS gel for which they can induce the phase separation by uh, supersaturating the, the the network and then cooling it down. And so there, there's, there are these nice micron sized drop or tens of micron sized droplets that uh, emerge. And if you look at what happens to the PDMS around it, there's a pocket that opens, uh, meaning that it's really uh, uh, expelled from the droplets. So there's this uh, kind of cons consensus paradigm on the fact that uh, these micron scale droplets exclude elastic networks when they phase separate and proceed to cavitate, so to, uh, to create really a cavity inside the, the, the surrounding net thing network. So what, what I'd like to do today is to challenge this paradigm and ask whether that's always the case. Uh, in particular, in vivo, is it the only scenario that is possible or can something else happen to the network? So back to basics. When we look at liquid liquid phase separation, starting from a mixed phase in orange here, and the red, the red liquid phase separates from the yellow one, in the absence of a network, unambiguously, the outcome is macroscopic droplets uh, that, that will uh, be, become as large as possible, so as to reduce the interfacial cost, the interfacial energy between the two liquids. Now, the question is, when there's a network 
present, the what happens to the network. And what I've just said is, is that the, in some cases, we've, uh, people have observed uh, cavitation, meaning that there's indeed, just as uh, in the absence of a network, a large macroscopic droplet that forms, and it fully expels the, the network. But it's not the only possible scenario that we can think of. Another one is the formation of um, uh, very small droplets in the interstices of the network that will not deform it, but remain confined. And this is a phase that I would call micro droplets. A third possibility is rather than expelling completely uh, the, the network, you can actually wet it, you can have it permeate through the, 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 the droplet and have uh, uh, the network crossing through the, the, the liquid phase separated droplet. Mm. So what I'd like to do today is to compare these different scenarios and try to assess which one is uh, the, uh, the most experimentally relevant as a function of the different uh, the, the, the different parameters. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, I, uh, I need to be able to compare the stability of these three, uh, three scenarios. And so I'm going to assume that we, we're at or near thermal equilibrium and uh, assess the energy, the free energy penalty that the network incurs compared to a reference scenario which, in which you have macroscopic phase, phase separation without elastic network. So let's start with the cavitation case, which uh, has already been considered in, in, a, in a few papers in the past, for which the elastic cost, so, so, so for which the, the main uh, free energy cost when, uh, when considering the, the phase separation comes from uh, the elastic energy stored in the, in the, the, in the network. Mm -hmm. So it's an elastic energy uh, that scales for so we, we cannot use simply uh, linear elasticity in order to assess this because we start from a very small pore and we stretch it to a macroscopic cavity and so we need a theory for nonlinear uh, for, for large deformation elasticity and the simplest such uh, theory which is well observed in uh, in simple polymer networks is the new hookian mechanism for which the cost the the elastic cost of creating such a cavity is proportional to the volume of that of that uh, droplet times the uh, the shear modulus of the of the uh, the network times a numerical factor that is of order one for incompressible nuclear material. But for instance, it's two point five. The so what this means is that you have an uh, is that the, in terms of energy, energy penalty per droplet volume, it's, it's a constant. If you divide this by the volume of the droplet, the free energy cost uh, induced by the elastic network is simply alpha G. So it's proportional to the network shear modulus. So that's, that's what happens for the cavitation free energy. And that's actually been, uh, that, that reasonably explains the, the observed uh, dependence of the phase separation temperature as a function of the stiffness of the, of the material observed by the group of Eric Dufresne. Now let's move on to the next scenario, micro droplets forming in the interstices of, uh, of the network. So in that case, because these droplets are very small and they do not deform substantially the, the network, what I'll assume is that the, free, the, the elastic energy is negligible, but that comes at, at a cost, which is uh, the fact of having a large interfacial area between the two liquids. And so that results in a surface ton, in energy between the red and the yellow liquid, which scales as the surface of a droplet. So 4 pi r squared is the, the, the area of the droplet times the liquid liquid surface tension. Now, if I assume that the characteristic size of these droplets is the mesh, mesh size of the network, and that you do not substantially deform the network, the energy penalty per droplet volume is now uh, proportional to the ratio between the liquid liquid surface tension to the network mesh size. And so the, the larger the mesh size or the slower the surface tension, the easier it's going to be to make these micro droplets. 
Moving on to the third uh, scenario, permeation. Now you have neither large el elastic energy because you, you allow the, the, the network to penetrate into the, the, the network, into the droplet, no large surface tension because the, these, these droplets are macroscopic, but you have a, a large interfacial area between the network and the red liquid. And so that results in a wetting energy. There's a cost for the red, uh, for wetting the, the network with the red liquid. And that, that cost, I'm going to write it as proportional to the volume of the droplet times the fraction of the network that remains inside the, uh, the, the, the droplet. So one minus phi, where phi is the expelled fraction. So cavitation would be phi equal one, uh, fully, fully excluding the, the network. But if phi is lower than one, there is wetting. And this is the dominant term. And this term sigma p here is what I call the permeation stress. So it, it has the, the, the dimension of uh, the, a stress and it quantifies the, the, the cost of uh, the, the interfacial energy between uh, the network and the, the red liquid. So again, if we, in order to do a, a quick scaling evaluation of our free energy, if we assume that the the network is not much def deformed and so phi is much lower than one, then the energy pen penalty per droplet volume is just this uh, permeation stress. So what is this permeation stress really? Well, in order to understand what this, uh, this quantity means, it's useful to look at the, to zoom in and look at what happens when a single filament pierces the liquid-liquid interface. So there's a difference in uh, liquid solid surface tension, gamma AS and gamma BS, between the two liquids and the solid, that will result on, uh, in the formation of a meniscus. And that meniscus in turn induces a capillary force on the, the, the filament that pushes it out of the hydrophobic liquid and in uh, out of the, the li liquid that likes the most the, the, the solid, that dislikes the most the solid and into the one that likes it the most. Uh, that's using this capillary force that some insects are able to walk on water. It, it, they use the fact that their weight is smaller than this capillary force. Now that's at the, the level of a single filament that I assume to be perpendicular to the to the interface. If now we zoom out of the and look at, at the network scale, there's an area, the number of filaments per unit area that pierce through the interface, and that uh, that results into a, a force per unit area, meaning a stress. So this permeation stress is the stress discontinuity that uh, is induced by having the the network. Uh, penetrating through the interface between the two liquids. So if you want, if, if that's the, the stress that you need to impose in order to push the, the network into the, the liquid it likes the least. So it can actually be positive or negative because the, 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 it, it depends on the ordering of these two uh, liquid solid surface tensions. So if it's negative, the, the surface, the network is going to be attracted into the droplet. If it's uh, positive, it's going to be partially expelled. So all in all, uh, so actually, I think the, this, this type of uh, permission stress has not yet been measured experimentally. And that's a question to experimentalists. Can anyone measure this, this quantity? Now, moving back to the to, 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 the, to our liquid-liquid phase separation uh, scenarios, we have three scenarios, uh, cavitation, micro droplets, and permeation, characterized by three uh, dominant energy costs, the elastic energy, the liquid-liquid interfacial energy, and the liquid-solid wetting energy. And using these this three uh, Scaling laws, we can define two dimensionless numbers. The elastic capillary number that I construct by dividing the surface to the elastic energy, 
and the permeoelastic number that I construct by dividing the, the wetting and the, the cavitation energy. So both are normalized by this, by this uh, elastic modulus G. As a function of these two numbers, I can ask what the most stable phase is. And it turns out that each of the three different scenarios that I've considered so far has a domain of stability in this phase diagram, in this pH plane. If the permeoelastic number is small, meaning if wetting is cheap, or if it's negative, then permeation is the, 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 the favored uh, scenario. If the, uh, if the elastocapillary number is small, meaning if the liquid-liquid tension is small, then the micro droplets are favored. And in the regular case of a, a, a high surface tensions and low elastic modulus, then cavitation is favored. So that, these are extremely simple scaling arguments that I've presented so far. The paper is much stronger than that because there's, uh, we've also done explicit mechanical modeling of these systems using continuum elasticity modeling at, at the single droplet level. And so what, what we look at is the, the nonlinear deformation of the network around a micro droplet and the, the, the scaling uh, of the, the energy as a function of permeation. I'm skipping extremely quickly through, through all this because the take home message of the many pages of analytic calculations that, that we've done is that the naive scaling argument is almost exact and that reproduces very quantitatively the, the phase diagram that uh, you, you would obtain by these more sophisticated techniques. So the, most, the main added value of these long calculations is the fact that we can also quantify the order of the transitions. And all of these are first order transitions, meaning that if you change the parameters, you, you have a discontinuous jump from micro droplets to cavitation or from cavitation to permeation. The, you do not observe the size of the micro droplets diverging, for instance, yeah, they, they jump. Either you're confined or you're cavitated. Now that's uh, that's it for the, quanti the, the, the the more quantitative part. But what I'd like to, to move on to now is the question of which of these phases are experimentally relevant. What uh, and in particular these two phases, micro droplets and permeation, that have not really been experimentally characterized yet. Is it are they there or is it uh, normal that we haven't seen them yet? Well, first we can look at the best, so, so, so to, to, do, to assess the experimental uh, relevance of these phases, I'm going to try to assess this, the value of these dimensionless numbers using data that I dug up from the literature. And the first system that uh, I've looked at is the oil and PDMS gels from the groups of uh, uh, Eric Frain and Robert Stein at ETH Street, for which uh, what I find is that the the permeolastic number is very large. It's, it's above 20 and up to 1,000. Sorry, the, the elastocapillary number is very large and the permeoelastic number is moderate. So the, the relevant regime is overwhelmingly uh, likely the cavitation regime and maybe permeation might be accessible in, in, in some cases. And indeed, what we observe, when, what they observe in their experiments is that the, the droplets cavitate. They become much, much larger than the mesh size. The mesh size of these networks is about uh, five to 10 nanometers, while the droplets that they observe grow up to tens of microns. So they're really in the cavitated regime. In contrast, if we look at uh, nuclear condensates forming inside the, the cell nucleus, or at cytoplasmic condensates forming inside the, 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 the cytoplasm. So there's much more uncertainty here due on, the, on the one hand to the fact that there are large error bars on the surface tensions on, on the elastic modulus, but also on the fact due to the fact that this encompasses many different types of systems. But in these two cases, what I find is that the, the biologically relevant uh, values for these numbers are not typically in the cavitation regime. In the nuclear condensates, the, the cavitation regime is accessible, but somewhat marginally, and micro droplets 
of permeation are the most likely scenarios. In the cytoplasmic condensates, I make the strong prediction that actually it's not possible to permeate. You're either going to uh, permeate, so to have the, the, the network going through the droplet, or uh, remain confined at the, the, the mesh size level. And the reason for that is that in these artificial networks, you have pretty dense networks because they're made of flexible floppy uh, polymers that have very little rigidity. And the liquid liquid surface tension of uh, these, the, these materials is pretty high. In contrast, in endogenous uh, condensates, you have a pretty loose network made of stiff polymers, in particular in the cytoplasm. And the liquid liquid interfacial tension be between this the intracellular medium and these phase separated condensates that also contain a lot of water and of proteins are typically very small. And so in these cases, these exotic quote unquote phases of micro droplets and permeation might be favored. So that's a prediction. Uh, and I, I leave it open to you. Are these nano droplets here? And if, if so, why haven't we seen them yet? Maybe that they're, that they're just too small to be optically resolved in the in the nucleus in particular, the typical size that they would have is in the tens to 30 nanometers. Uh, is there permeation in particular in the in the cytoplasm? And what this shows really is that we have a need for novel biomimetic systems that operate in the regime of biological system, uh, of truly true, true biological system. Because the artificial systems of uh, oil in water uh, or oil in PDMS type, type of systems are really operating in a different physical regime from the, the, the ones that, from, from in vivo. I'll conclude with a few speculations about where these exotic phases might be and what, what they might be useful for. So first, a first speculation is that in the cell nucleus, uh, there's these large droplets called the nucleoli, which actually contain some uh, nucleolar DNA. So there's a part of chromatin that goes into the, 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 these, these nucleoli. And so that might be somewhat explained by the permeation scenario. Another type of droplets that uh, have been characterized recently is this condensates of heterochromatin that have been shown to be related to the phase separation of a protein called HP1 alpha. And it looks very much like this permeation scenario with a negative permeation stress so that the, the droplet, the phase separating droplet, would condensate and at, attract the surrounding network, making it denser. And finally, there's a class of uh, a very small intracellular condensates called, called uh, transcription complexes or transcription complex uh, condensates that might be at the level of the mesh size of the of the, the, the DNA. And so maybe it's just a maybe the, the micro droplets, the elastically limited micro droplets phase uh, could explain them the, and explain their size control. All in all, we have a new paradigm for liquid network interaction inside cells with a flurry of novel possibilities for these uh, uh, for, for, for the morphologies of these uh, of these systems there's a need for experimental work as well as the need for extending the, the this, this theory in the direction of exploring the many things we've neglected so far so we've neglected the the viscoelasticity of the cellular medium if you keep pushing and exerting a laplace pressure on the medium the stress will relax in the, 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 in the network. And so the, there's a time scale at which elasticity stops being relevant. We've not looked at the kinetics of formation of these droplets uh, and their, their ripening. Neither at the, so I have not presented uh, our, our results on strain stiffening, but the simple models for liquid liquid, uh, for, for network elasticity that I've used uh, are not really realistic for intracellular media. and. This, because this network tend to stiffen on the, on the tension. Finally, we have interaction between droplets that are not only due to the ripening, but also mediated by the, the network that we've not looked at. And there's the whole big question of non-equilibrium uh, scenarios, including everything that uh, Jenny mentioned in, in her beautiful talk that we have just not start, started addressing.
Uh, but all in all, what the take home message is that the cellular environment imposes mechanical constraints on membraneless condensates that can shape their morphology. So it's the, the, the reference is on archive. I'd like to thank my collaborators, uh, Miko Hataya, Andrei Kushmol, and uh, Sheng Mao, as well as Cliff uh, on other, uh, other papers, and the friends on Inspirers that have this, enjoyed a lot discussing this project with me. And finally, thanks a lot to the organizers and thanks to you for your attention. Okay, Pierre, thanks for the talk. You see a lot of questions in the chat box. So let me just try to uh, pick up. So starting from Robin, I will ask, is the cytoplasm really incompressible as assumed? Well, I know that you talk about the visual elasticity and actually uh, later, Lauren uh, Hall asked, following on Robin's question, how do you expect visual elasticity to modulate the phase down? Can you? Just speculate some. Okay, so the first, the incompressibility, I do not assume incompressibility. The, On the cavitation you of Eric Dufresne, it is assumed that the medium is incompressible. Yes, but if you relax at that, that assumption, and add, uh, so in, in this graph is our uh, model, modeling results for various values of the, the Poisson ratio. So the, the blue one is near incompressible and the other ones are, are, are compressible, essentially nothing changes. Mm -hmm. The only thing that, uh, that's, the only case where things qualitatively change is in the oxetic case, so when the Poisson ratio is negative. Thank you. But qualitatively, it's, uh, the incompressibility of the network is not necessary. The question about viscoelasticity is much more tricky, and that's, as I mentioned in the end, something that we have not really explored. Uh, one thing that I, I can mention is that the cavitation occurs in a, a polyelastic network at a fixed cavitation pressure. If, the, if we're in a viscoelastic system, that the, the stress will relax in the, in the network, and so the, the, that pressure will slowly decrease, and the cavitated scenario will be slowly and slowly relaxed and less disfavored. So if we, if we have a small droplet and look at, its, uh, at the time course of its evolution, if it stays there too long, it will push on the, the surrounding network and finally, start, uh, finally cavitate. So there's a question of time scale between the turnover of these droplets and the, 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 the lifetime and the viscoelastic time of the surrounding network. David Stewart asked you a related question. Is the skill energy dissipation sufficient to affect these phases? Uh, any qualitative thoughts on how that would change this picture? Shifting boundaries, introducing new faces, or things. So again, you know, let's talk about the time scale. Is the scale of energy dissipation sufficient to affect these phases? Do you need David to elaborate on this? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Basically your last point about non-equilibrium. What can you say about non-equilibrium even hand wavily that might change? Uh, well, there are many, many different ways of being out of equilibrium, but the simplest one is just to have a change of effective temperature that is not really targeted at affecting the, the, the processes that we're looking at, in which case I, I, I expect that it's uh, just going to risk case, to, to shift the, the different quantities without affecting the, the phase diagram too much. The one, one type of non-equilibrium that could really affect the, that kind of phase diagram is having chemical reactions inside the, 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 these droplets. So if these droplets serve as crucibles that, uh, in which there's, that recruit some, some type of clients, have the reaction done and expel the, 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 the product, then it, it, the, that there might be a strong interplay with the with the morphology of the phase. I'm not going to speculate more because I'd say ob obviously wrong th th things, but I think that's definitely an, uh, a very interesting direction to, to pursue. Okay, I see uh, Peter Austed wrote a long paragraph. Maybe uh, is a question or comment? Can you just talk yeah, about Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll simplify it. If, yeah. um, if you have phase separation in a clean system, the droplets will coarsen and get larger and larger. Of course, biology is not a clean system. 
So any junk is going to go to the interface and stop the coarsening and lower the surface tension. And so my question was actually whether the network, the polymer network can actually go to the interface hmm. and build up a gel layer or something like that. And I know that Geraldine Seydoux has seen gel layers on the, on the surface of droplets. Do you have any comment about that effect, which doesn't seem to be in your list of possibilities? Uh, it's not there because I forgot. It's in the paper, we mentioned this as an unexplored possibility. And mm -hmm. it's, I'm afraid, st still only that. What's true is that if, if there's, and there is a regime of parameter, if we just look at this, uh, this type of diagrams, in which if the two uh, liquid solid uh, tensions are significantly smaller than the liquid liquid tension, you, you, you will tend to, do, to align the filament with the interface so that the, the, the network shields one liquid from the other. Uh, and and you so you have drawn, you've drawn the filament as if the filament width is much, much larger than the interfacial width between the two liquids. Is that actually the case? If you look at the capillary width due to the surface tension, uh, is this separation of scales the right separation of scales? Nope, I don't think it is. <laughs> okay. Fair point. I mean, it will depend on the, the, the chemical nature of the separation, but... Yeah, but I think for none of the systems I've been mentioning, uh, the, I mean, I think these two lengths are commensurate in, right. in all of these systems. In the, in the PDMS case, it's a molecular, uh, it's molecular uh, filaments uh, mm -hmm. in... Uh, Oil, oil uh, interface. So, and I expect the, the, the interface width to be to be above about the same as the the, the filament width. Mm -hmm. And in the nucleus, nuclear and cytoplasmic condensates, it's probably the same. These are thicker thicker filaments with wider interfaces. So, right. Okay. This, yeah, it's it's more of a simplified picture to give an idea of the, the scaling rather than, than a, a truly a model. Okay. Thanks. I think that's fair to say that. So Jie Lin has a few questions. Can you ask? Is Jie here? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, hi. 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 So happy. Yeah. So I have a, a simple question is, so it's not clear to me why the wetting energy scales with the, silver, with the droplet volume. Is it? It's because the amount of network that is inside the droplet is proportional to the droplet volume. Yeah, I saw that the energy should be proportional to the total length of the polymer, which doesn't have to be I mean, proportional. Yes, so the length of the polymer is basically the, the, like the, the length, length per unit volume, which is... Uh, a property of the material times the volume. Mm -hmm. And it's, if it's partially expelled, then there's this one minus phi uh, factor, but it's still, it, it, it remains uh, proportional to the volume. Okay. So yeah, I have one more question is, now from the schematic you draw, it looks like, like the real situation can be a combination of cavitation and permeation, no? Like just for, by looking at the schematic you draw, <laughs> yeah, uh, I should really redo this kinetics. I mean, uh, the the network is compressed also in the permeation case, no? Yes, it, it, it can be partially expelled. So if you have a permeation stress that is positive, the network dislikes, quote unquote, the, the red liquid and it will be stre stretched out inside the, the red liquid and compressed at the, 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 the border, but it's not cavitated in the sense that you're not uh, op opening a hole in it. So okay. it's, it's much less violent for the, for the material in a sense. It's just you stretch apart and you compress, mm -hmm. compress it around. Thank you. Uh, Wiley, do you want to ask a question? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I had a question about the phase diagram. Um, you partially answered it already, but I was wondering if um, the abrupt transitions between the phases, do you think that um, like physically in a cell that could happen? 
Or to actually do that, you'd have to take some more complicated like trajectory through phase space, for instance, to go from micro droplets to cavitation, like stuff has to move out of the way. Uh, I think it's the second one. I think the, even, even though, I mean, even though the, I'm saying that these phase transitions between these three morphologies are, are first order, if you just slowly change a parameter, you don't really have you're near equilibrium, so the liquid is not really supersaturated, and so you would need uh, so, so the barrier, the nucleation barrier of opening a cavity if you're in the micro droplet phase, for instance. Once you've stabilized the micro droplet phase, is going to be very large, uh, unless you go deep enough. So okay, thank what, you. Yeah, one thing that I can say is that the, there's, a, there's a limit of stability, uh, a thermodynamic limit of stability uh, that I drew here. But from our calculations, we also find that there's a limit of uh, metastability uh, above which the micro droplets are not stable at all and will just diverge in size. So actually, that, 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 that would be one way of, uh, if you change the parameters, and go through that line, it's, it's like going through a spin you, you will observe immediately uh, cavitation. Hmm, that was not very clear. Okay, I think that's it. Um, probably um, we can uh, move to stop the recording and uh, move to the informal discussion. I know still a lot of questions.